members who work in the Environment Agency, people who do um, uh, uh, food standards agency. So these sort of the Care Quality Commission, yep. Yep. Blood and Transplant ser Service, wow. all of these kind of so quite a broad union, but predominantly all within the, the, well, the, the public sector. The backbone of how much of this country runs. The last time we spoke, before we go to the calls, and this will be the last question from me, was uh, last week, I think you were in Bristol, as yeah. I recall, on a day of action. Since then, I've got to ask, have there been any movements of either side? Do you sense that there is an opportunity that conversations might achieve something, Christina? Well, not at the moment. We have asked again for meetings. My, my colleague who works with me, who's our lead negotiator in the NHS, as I used to be a few years back, she um, did meet Steve Barclay last week, but it was mainly at our request and it was really just a discussion about what the future strikes are going to look like because he wouldn't, he still won't talk about pay. But we've, we're, we're, We've reached a settlement in Scotland where the Scottish government put more money in. We're um, we're close, I think. Well, we've we've had more money from the Welsh government, and trade unions are meeting today in Wales to consider the offer that's been put in the Do table. You sense there could be a deal. Close I, I, to I sense there could be um, uh, because it's Wales. money on top of the fourteen hundred pounds that has been paid out, but absolutely nothing and nothing. So that would leave England effectively as an outlier, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, already the difference between Scotland and and. Uh, in England pay. I always think this must affect trust near the border. A nurse in, in Scotland will earn roughly about £2,000 more per year than a nurse in England. Really? Yeah. So just for going north of the border you get yeah. extra. Well how do you feel if you're a nurse how do you feel about that if you're looking at your compartment, com counterpart the other side of the border? Yeah. Let's get to the calls Christina you've got headphones on so we're good to go uh, it's Joe in Petersfield who's through first. Joe go ahead you're through to Christina McNey. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning Christina. Your question. Um, yeah, I've, I've, my question is, where is the money going to come from to finance any wage increases? And the reason I put this question to you is because I did a study a while ago on NHS costs, the cost of the NHS, and compared 2000 with 2021. What I came up with was that in 2000, NHS spent £49 billion pounds. In 2021, it spent £201 billion, which was an increase of 310%. But at the same time, the average wage, the average taxpayer's wage, went from £16,900 <clears throat> to £31,200, an increase of 85%. Right. In other words, the cost of the NHS to the taxpayer rose almost four times faster than the increase of taxpayers' wages. So let's come to the key point. I'll keep you on the line, Joe. Um, maybe move a little bit away from the figures. Where is the money to come from, Joe is asking? So, you know, governments always have to make difficult decisions about, one, how to raise money, but also how to spend money. And it depends on where they put the priorities. I mean, we would say there are some things they could do, which is they could look at things like corporation tax and capital gains tax, make them more equivalent to... Um, I mean, one of those is going up already, isn't it? Co yeah, corporation tax is going up to 25% uh, this year. But the capital gains tax, uh, you know, if you if you make your money through um, buying and selling property or stocks and shares or and selling stocks and shares, you pay less in tax than the people I represent who pay their tax through PAYE. And is that right? I mean, should that be what happens? So there are ways you could raise taxes. But there's other things. We, I mean, I think when you look at the profits that have been made by some of the energy companies recently, another windfall tax shouldn't be out of the question. And then there's the absolutely billions and billions of pounds completely defrauded from the from the country during Covid and I'm not seeing much much evidence that they're doing much to get that back again. I mean when it comes to the oil companies of course you're probably where companies such as BP or ESSO would point out only 5% of their profits are generated by the so although it's a vast top line figure 38 billion yeah. pounds in fairness and it's still a lot of money only 5% is out of the UK of course you're aware of that. Yeah I'm aware of that And but when you listen to the chief exec of, of um, I think it was the chief exec of Shell actually said to this government you should tax us more you know so they recognise that they're making excessive profits even in this country they're making excessive profits Joe quick response from you to Christine's, uh, Christine's answer. Well my response is this that the cost over 20 years of the NHS has more than trebled whereas the taxpayer's average wage has gone up 85%. Right. And your solution is more tax. Quick a word from you, Christina, on yeah. that. So, 
Um, costs in the NHS have gone up because the NHS has its own inflationary pressure, so they're not just dictated by inflation in the countries. Things like the cost of medicines, the cost of uh, you know equipment that they have to buy is often higher than the standard rate of of um, of inflation. But uh, I mean, we still in this country pay less into our NHS than even you know than lots of other countries do in Europe, and even in America, they, there's a higher percentage spent on the health service in America than there is in this country, and yet they have worse outcomes than we have. So our NHS may be expensive, but it's also, you know, we get good out- outcomes across a whole range of different illnesses and, and conditions. Just explain that regarding the United States, because, of course, a lot of people will be aware that they, we don't have an, they don't have an equivalent such as the NHS. So where does that expenditure come so from? The, it does come from taxpayers, but so it comes from people who, who buy insurance policies or it comes from the government who pay for... Um, you know the, the Medicare, the kind of state-provided one, uh, and yet still, you know, millions of people go into um, uh, go bankrupt mm. every year in the US because they can't they afford can't to afford pay. Them. Okay, and you know, we don't want to go down that road, I'm sure. Joe, thank you for that. Bob's in Harrow. Bob, your question to Christina. Good morning, Christina, and good morning, Nick, and Hello, all sir. your listeners. Hello, thank you, uh, Christina, for your members. First of all, a big thanks for getting those ambulances into Ukraine. Your, your Unison members stepped up to the plate. No doubt they will do the same again when called upon to do so, to show the best of British when they help the, the people in Turkey. My question to you is this, Christina. You've done, Uni, Unison members have done so much for the Ukrainians and led by example, and they will do so much for the Turkish. The, the anger, the frustration, when I speak to the guys I served with who are now Unison members, who are paramedics, when our loved ones are handed over to the, to the care, your members look after them, and then they are given over to the hospitals where there are backlogs and delays, the anger, the frustration, the, the desperation that I hear in these guys' voices who are true professionals when their care is handed over and, and let down so badly and so many people are not looked after in the hospitals. Christina, what can you do? to help these guys, to help us, to help our loved ones, to make sure the care is continuous. You've got the biggest union in the country. You've got the power. You've got the dynamism. Please help. What? Christina? Uh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, and, and yeah, you're right. We Our members did sort of send over ambulances. They worked with the ambulance employers to send over ambulances to Ukraine. I'm just uh, getting messages this morning from um, many of our members saying that there's so many of them from their ambulance depot who have volunteered to, to go over and work um, in uh, in Turkey and Syria. So, yeah, that will definitely be happening. Um, I understand the frustration and anger because I've been round during the, the ambulance disputes and even be, when we were balloting our members, I was, I was round talking to paramedics and call handlers and people who work in the ambulance service, asking them about what are the main pressures they've got. And it's quite appalling when you hear some of the things. I've had experienced paramedics tell me that they used to do something like eight or nine call-outs in a, in a shift, so they'd go out and see eight or nine patients. And over the past sort of six months to a year, that has gradually gone down to one a day because they would pick someone up and wait outside the hospital. And, and this is the difficulty in handing, let's say it's me, in handing me over from the paramedic to actually get me booked in by the triage nurse or whoever it might be. They, they can't get over that hurdle. Is that the problem, Chris? Yeah, and so what you have now is you have, you have ambulance crews who sit outside hospitals who work with the staff in the hospitals because they're overstre- they're totally stretched mm. as well. But they'll sit with a patient for, you know, eight, nine hours, whatever. Um, but they'll take them into the hospital for x-rays, bring them back to the ambulance. They'll take them into the hospital for blood tests, bring them back to the ambulance. Why can't they be left in the waiting area? Because, of the or because they're full and they can't, and they would need to have. So there are certain systems being set up where one or two ambulance crews will... Um, will actually stay in the hospital in a waiting area with perhaps the patients from about four or five ambulances to try and free up the rest of them and the rest of them can hand their patients over to them and go. But that only happens in in certain areas where they've got room for it. And, you know, people are really frustrated. And one of the problems you've got is that people are leaving in their droves. So I was in an ambulance trust last week where... um, so the call handlers, the people who take the 999 calls, they were telling me that the turnover rate is around 40%. Right, And okay. that trust has been out in New Zealand trying to recruit paramedics because they can't recruit them in this country. Where would you be? There was a story... Thank you very much for your call, Bob. There was a story yesterday that from the RCN, Pat Cullen, who I'm sure you know of or probably know, that at the next wave of industrial disputes, they might seek to take nurses out of A&D units and cancer wards as well, because they want to obviously maximise the impact. Would you support that? 
I, I mean, it's up it's up to the to that union what they want to do. I mean, we also have nurses as well. We're the second biggest nursing union, and we would so we've we've had members on strike, nurses on strike, and other um, NHS. Well, even workers. more relevant then, if yeah, you yeah. if you act for nurses, would you support that? Well, it would depend, I think, in the circumstances. But even with that, you would always still provide emergency cover. I mean, we're obliged to provide. I think we're legally obliged to provide emergency cover, and I have to say, most of our members would want to provide emergency cover. Would that count in council wards? Would that be deemed emergency? I see A and E obviously by the name on the tin. Would that count in count? Would that count in cancer wards? I would think it would. I can't imagine the time when when pe- people would just walk away from a cancer ward. Or you know, if you look at midwives who have taken strike action occasionally, or certainly once when I was involved with them, um, you know, they, they're never going to walk out and leave a woman in labour. It's just not going to happen. And I, and every single picket line I was on, I, I did a tour from. Yorkshire up to um, Gateshead a few a couple of weeks ago, mm-hmm. and in every single picket line, people came off. Our members came off the picket lines to get into ambulances to go okay. out and deal with emergencies. So that happens all the time. Just lastly, on picket lines, you'll be aware Mick Lynch has criticised Sir Keir Starmer in the past, saying he's a vanilla politician. He said he should be on the picket lines. Paul Novak of the TUC says he should actually be off. He said Sir Keir was rather off the picket line taking service and rather he was in Parliament trying to get the Labour Party into power. Which side of the fence are you on? Yeah, I'm very much on Paul's side. I, I, to be honest, if, if MPs want to come and sit in a picket line, great, but you're moving the focus away. The Labour Party's not in power. And just having somebody coming to your picket line is not going to change things, much as it might make them feel good and probably make the people in the picket line feel good. But that's not going to change things. We need the Labour Party in power and we need them pushing the government to come to the table and negotiate with us. Would you discourage them from coming down? I wouldn't discourage them. If they want to come, it's absolutely fine. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, and focus on their I'm jobs. sure they'll, you know, if you're in a picket line, it's quite nice if your local MP comes down to show support. But, you know, I'm not... I, I just don't want that focus shifted. I think the focus has to be square and fairly on this government, not on the Labour Party. Uh, let's come to another call. Keith's in Upminster. Keith, you're through to Christina McInerney. Go ahead with your question. Morning to you. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm, um, well, I'm, I'm a carer for an elderly parent who's uh, 97 in June. Right. And um, she does have to have a lot of um, female carers who come in two or three times a day to do personal care. Right. And a lot of those are driving older cars because they, ah. they're not on a massive wage. And a lot of those are going to be affected because... Our bar is right on the edge of the... You're talking the about ULES, are you? ULES. Right. And a lot, okay. of our care, a lot of our carers that come in are either going to have to stop work and okay. do, do alternate jobs, or they're not going to be, a, or they're going to have to pay twelve pound fifty a day if they keep their current vehicles. Let's put that. Just, I don't know how about about the introduction of ULES. Yeah, you, yeah. you do, you're aware, and it's coming in as of August twenty nine. And there is the argument that carers and those on the lower pay scale are going to be hit. Nurses on night shifts, paramedics on night shifts, and so on and so on. What's your stance on the ULES? So I think it is a bit of on the one hand and on the other hand because on the one hand I can understand why particularly in places like London or other big cities, you want to bring it in because of the poor air quality, the impact it has on on people, the impact it has on children or in schools, etc. But equally, I am I'm absolutely aware of the impact it will be on having on essential workers and low paid workers. And that's another reason why I think we have to, there has to be a lot more thought going into a bit exemptions for some of them or support to, to upgrade their car, buy a new car, because you can't, it's just impossible for somebody like that. You know, the example that's just been given about yes. care workers. I mean, most of them are on the minimum wage of £9.50 yeah, they've got to find an, an hour. extra £60-plus a week. Yeah, it's just not possible. No. And, and, you know, that, again, will have a massive impact on the care service, and which, again, has a massive impact on the NHS. And, you know, they're all interlinked. So I mean, there's another union, the GMB, who's criticised it with the impact on staff, particularly that it has at Heathrow. When you look at the fact that people's gas bills are going up, electricity bills are going up, if they're fortunate enough to have a house, their mortgages are going up, if they're renting that, it's all only going in one way. What would you suggest to Mayor Khan that it needs to delay? As, as Martin Lewis, the financial guru, has said, the idea is very valid. It's the introduction. We need to look to delay it. Christina? So... I'd, I'd need a bit more information before I could say definitely delay it or not. Um, but I think there needs to be more conversation about how we support those lower paid workers and essential workers and whether there's some other scheme that can be brought in that maybe gives them more time or gives them more support and able to, to enable them to meet the, the requirements of the ULZ. Sam's in Edinburgh. Thank you for your question, Keith. Sam, you're through to Christina. Go ahead. Hi, Nick. Hi, Christina. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Sam. 
Right. So uh, I'm a, an undergraduate student at the University of Edinburgh. I'm originally from the U.S., but I've got dual citizenship with the U.S. and the U.K. And um, one of the biggest issues that I've thought um, we're already kind of decent way through the strikes. Uh, I've roughly missed about uh, around a week so far in terms of lecture content and just in-person uh, activity, and I'm sure it's going to keep on going. But uh, I'm just wondering, from being from the U.S. and having applied to universities both in the U.K. and in the U.S., isn't there a worry from the union of the that there's going to be tremendous damage done to U.K. universities on the world stage because of these strikes? I've seen some statistics that say after Brexit, uh, the U.K. universities increased the admittance of international national students by roughly 60 percent in the years, but also because uh, but also following Brexit, the amount of international students applying to UK universities have decreased significantly. And I'm, I, I, I imagine that the strikes will also have quite a negative reputation for international students. So I'm wondering if uh, what your thoughts would be on that. Uh, Christina. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, um, I mean, I'm sure strikes don't help any organisation, do they? That's why, you know, most unions don't want to be on strike. It's the final, you know, the last resort. It's the same in the university sector. They don't want to be on strike. Uh, but equally, and I can't speak for lecturers because we don't represent them, but I know that many of them are in part-time, uh, in very um, uh, precarious contracts, so they're only employed certain hours a week, etc., uh, for for the members I represent, people I represent in universities, they tend to be the lower paid staff. So mm -hmm. they'll be the cleaning, catering, portering, some technicians and admin staff. But the, I tell you, I used to be the lead negotiator for the universities in, in my union. And it's not a well-paying sector. Um, and uh, th there comes a point when staff have to do something to speak up for but themselves. What about the damage, possibly, yeah. at the, Sam's, the global reputation? Well, because I think Sam is right. It's fair to say some British universities have a tremendous global reputation. They do. And I can remember when I got a really good pay increase from the university sector one day, one, one, one year, um, my argument to them was, you have we have one of the best university sectors in the world, but do you want that built on the backs of low-paid workers? And I was talking to people who were in, you know, the, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, the, the, the sort of well-known prestigious mm -hmm. universities mm -hmm. who were actually the lowest peers at that time in the entire public sector. And it's a good a case to make. You can't build a world-class organisation or service if you're not paying your staff decently. But how much damage is being done by these strikes? I'm sure it is causing damage, um, but I think people will still come here. And we're not the only country where this is happening. I mean, strikes are happening in universities across Europe that I'm aware of. Not every single country, but in a significant number. So this is happening elsewhere. There is an issue about how you pay staff. OK, thanks for that, Sam. A couple of questions on the emails. Uh, this comes in from Ella Jean. Christina has just said she wants to get Labour into power. Will they simply find more money then to pay all her people what they require? Where, if we expand that argument, what do you think Labour would be? Because if there's no money in the country, there's no money in the country, or is it the, the taxation that you would look to? Well, I, I think Labour... I mean, we're affiliated to the Labour Party, yes. so, we, so we would campaign for them. Um, I, I think the difference... There's a number of differences, and I've worked as a negotiator through Labour administrations and through Conservative administrations and there is a significant difference in the way they engage with trade unions. So they are more likely to sit down and talk to us, they're more likely to look at big picture stuff around can we have a different bargaining strategy, they're more likely to see us as part of the kind of social infrastructure of the country rather than as the enemy and that all adds to a better um, negotiating environment shall we say. Um, I think Labour will inherit a mess, if I'm honest, if they get into power in one or two years. I think they'll inherit um, a country that's on its knees uh, and they'll have to take some serious decisions about how they spend their money. So I'm not naive. I don't expect them to come in and wave a magic wand and suddenly give everybody in the public sector a 20% pay increase. But I do think they'll be able to perhaps make some different decisions about where they spend their money, what their priorities are. And, and prioritise our services that have got so run down, education, health, just two examples and what's happening in local government. Let me read you this one from Rachel in Bexley. Christina sounds a very honest woman, so let's see if she's candid about this. Just how much contact does she have with people such as Mick Lynch and others when they decide to do a day of action? How coordinated is it? Um, so we coordinate more in sectors rather than across the union. I meet Mick and others... Um, 
when we go to the TUC. So we have meetings at the TUC. But I think there's this image for trade. You, you said is. at the beginning yeah, about yeah. trade union barons. I think sometimes the government like to think we're sitting in a dark room somewhere and we're all planning it. You know, we've got a board in front of us and we're like, so I'll bring these out here and I'll bring these out here. And it's not like that. It's not like that. It's not because like that. Because there is, you were, you'd have been a child, but in the 70s, it was perceived to be like that. And I yeah, think yeah. there was some validity it, to that argument. And yeah. some people would paint you in that corner now that you phone Pat Cullen, you phone Mick Lynch, you sit in a dark room, right, next <laughs> Tuesday, let's do it. The reality is what? The reality is it's much more likely that it'll be me, Pat Cullen, um, at the GMB and Unite, generally secretaries because we've all got members in similar sectors so we will talk about it uh, and some unions are keener to, to coordinate than others but coordination doesn't necessarily mean taking action in the same day coordination can mean as we saw last week a kind of rolling program of industrial action which was was very, very disruptive there's now probably going to be a bit of a gap but why will there be a gap? Sorry, well, explain to the uh, listeners. So I don't, I don't think there's any. I, I'm not aware of any action planned this week. Um, certainly in in the health sector. Right. Um, so the you know each union will look at its own strategies. And the thing is, we're democratic organisations. So even if I wanted to be the person that sat in the room and said, "This is when we'll take strike action," I can assure you that our members, including the ambulance workers, would soon put me in my place and say, "No, no, we will decide." what our strategy will be, not you. Have you got an existing mandate for more strike action or do you have to go back to your members as regards to paramedics? No, we've got an existing mandate for... How long is that good for? Um, about another six months, I think. Who is it? Um, and we're just, we're, we've got a ballot running. So we've got five ambulance trusts in England out, um, where we have a mandate. We're ba- currently balloting uh, in the other trusts in England and Wales and we get the results of that at the end of this week. And if we get more trust over the 50%, then we'll probably be taking more industrial action Well, I've been month. speaking to you on freezing cold picket lines through the winter. There's every possibility I'll be speaking to you on picket lines through the spring and summer, isn't there? I would think so, Strikes sadly. Will. Unless unless the government come to the senses and actually will sit in a room with us like grown-ups and have a conversation about how we resolve this. So, talking resolve, no weakening the resolve of your members? I don't see that, no. Through the summer we go. Audrey is in Tunbridge Wells. You're through to Christina McInerney. Go ahead, Audrey. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Christine. Christina. Um, Sorry. Um, Are you satisfied with the support you are getting from Keir Starmer? Uh, Good morning, Audrey. Um, Well, I think Keir and the other uh, front bench, uh, Labour Party front benches, are making a good case in Parliament. Um, You know, to be honest, I don't expect the leader of the opposition to stand up and say, I think it's right that nurses walk off a, a cancer ward. I mean, it's just not going to happen, no matter how much I would want him to be 100% behind us. You know, he has to portray himself and the Labour Party as a, as a, as a uh, you know, a party that will govern the whole country. A viable government, former so government. So I totally yeah. understand that. Um, but the, the, I, I, th- I said earlier t- uh, to Nick, the difference is if Labour's in power, they will talk to us. And even now, when they're in opposition, they will talk to us. And if I think... I, if I don't like something that's being said, believe me, I will tell them I don't like it. doesn't necessarily mean they listen to me or they'll change their mind, but I, I leave them in no doubt about whether I think they've made a mistake in a policy or a direction of travel. So we have a fairly robust relationship with them. I mean, I see my role as, uh, people have often said, you know, it's speaking truth to power. The Labour Party's not in power yet, but I still feel that's my role is to tell them what what would be better for unison, but they have to take account of what would be better for everyone. Who's more supportive of the trade union movement, Sir Keir Starmer or Jeremy Corbyn? Uh, Well, I I, I mean, I imagine if you sat down with Jeremy, he'd probably tell you he was 100% behind us and he'll turn up to picket lines, but the difficult... But in a sense, he's not in power and he's not going to be in power. And what we need is a Labour government that can actually effect change. Can Jeremy Corbyn be part of the Labour Party in your view? Can he stand as a Labour MP? Well, if he, if he uh, well, meets... The party the, at the moment, of course, he's outside the party. He is. Sure and I mean, I'm not aware. I'm, I'm not that closely involved. So I don't know the detail, but I'm pretty certain that the, the whip was probably had conversations with him, may still be having conversations with him about how he can come back to the party. OK. And uh, thank you for that, Audrey. Another one from the emails here. Uh, Leonard, in Tower, oh, Leonard in Tower Hill. Would you support police officers going on strike? Christina said she has support workers with support workers in her union. What did you mean by that? I imagine that's backroom staff, is it? You, you, obviously, you don't have officers. We don't have officers because no. they can't join a no, trade indeed. union. Um, Would you support the idea of something such as police officers? 
I, personally, I think everyone should have the right to withdraw their labour. I mean, I, I kind of recognise that there may be some, like the army, for example, yes. might be difficult. But if you're a serving police officer or even a, you know, a prison officer, because they can't take no, strike indeed. action either, um, it just seems really unfair. And if you if you have that contract with them, that surely means you have to have a much better system of how you pay them and they ought to have a much better say in that. If they can't withdraw their labour, then you can't exploit that as a government by not paying them decent pay. Now, I teased you a little bit about the dark days of the 1970s and the idea of being a union baron, but you will be aware news this morning shows that more days were lost to strike action last year since 1989. We go back that far. You may well have had sight of these figures. A, how do you react to that? B, is there any sense of guilt that you might be holding Britain back from trying to work its way out of the post-pandemic period? I think we've done our bit, in term, and certainly the people I represent have done their bit in getting us through the pandemic. They were the ones that were going out every single day before we even knew there was going to be a vaccine. Ambulance workers, health workers, social workers, environment, environment agency staff, police support staff were going to their work every single day and make an, in contact with people and they didn't know whether they'd COVID or or even how they would get well if they did get COVID. So I think we've done our bit in a sense, and I think it's for the government to repay but them. when you hear that figure, does your heart not sink a little bit? It does. Respectfully, your job is to negotiate, and you've been telling yeah. me about in the past how you did well with university staff and you've done that. I mean, it's not necessarily your fault. You haven't done very well here, you and your colleagues. No, in- no, I completely accept that. A strike is the last resort. A strike, in some ways, is a, sense, is a sign of failure. Indeed. That we failed to actually... And your members don't get paid. And the members don't get paid. I mean, it's serious. We don't take strikes... Lightly. I, mean, I was out on picket lines last week. People have had four days strike. Have had four days of strike. That means they've lost four days' pay. Yeah. I mean that's serious. And I certainly would never call people out on strike on a whim or, or you know. So that that. So okay. yeah, I, I I do worry about it. I do think, you know, that it's not a good place for the country to be. But again, I would say. The government is doing absolutely nothing about it. I mean, I can't believe how, as 30 years as a negotiator, I can't really recall ever being in this situation. When we had a strike in the NHS in 2014, I was the lead negotiator in the NHS. It wasn't a massive strike, didn't last a long time. But we resolved it one night about 10 o'clock with me sitting opposite Jeremy Hunt and Simon Stevens, who was then Chief Executive of of NHS NHS England. England. And Jeremy Hunt was the Secretary of State we sat in a room together about 10 o'clock at night. They finally found a way to put some more money in. We, as the unions agreed, we would take that back to our members and we suspended action. So it's possible to do it. It's just that for some reason this government has decided that it's going to bury their head in the sand and What's hope it all goes away. Barclay, the health secretary? I, I'm sure he's a, you know, a decent person, an MP who wants to do the right thing, but... The impression I get is that his hands are tied by the Treasury and I'm really disappointed in Jeremy Hunt, if I'm honest, because he was the Secretary of State for a long time. Did you have a cordial relationship when he was health secretary? We had a reasonable, I mean, call it cordial, it might be sound a bit too warm, but we had a working relationship. OK. Um, and, but when he became the chair of the Health and, and Care Select Committee, he became much more open about what the problems were in both the health and care sector and how they needed to be resolved. And now he seems to have just slipped back into, you know, Tory mode of saying we can't spend any money. Lastly, what do you take from the deal that's been done with bus drivers in south-west London? This is a Balio, the company. We understand it's an 18% pay rise to finish the dispute, but that is to be taken over two years, so characterise obviously 9%, 9%. Is that something that might excite your members? Oh, definitely. <laughs> I'm sure they would. Um, and well done to Unite for getting that. Um, uh, th- there is a big difference, and I keep having to remind our members, our, our, our activists about this, like, you know, the people who are involved yeah. in the union. Um, when you're negotiating in a sector, and Sharon Graham and I have had these conversations, when because they're the biggest union in the private sector, we're the biggest Sharon union in the Unite, public. Just yeah. remind my listeners, yeah, no, yes, my she's job, general secretary yeah. of Unite. Um, and, 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 you know, it is... Another there, baron. There's a definite... <laughs> There's a difference when you're negotiating with a company that makes profits, then you can use leverage to get them to release some of those profits back to the workforce. When you're dealing with public services that rely on central government funding, you're, you're, the leverage you've got is, is very different. You can't say you've made X amount in profits that has to go back to, this, to the staff. Right. So there's a different approach to the negotiations there. We're very late. Would you, can I ask for one more question? Would that be all right? Because this, uh, this uh, woman's been hanging on the line for some time. Apologies, Amy and Kingsley, and yours is the final question to Christina. Go ahead. Morning to you. Thanks for holding. 
Hello, that's OK. Um, first of all, I fully support all your members' solidarity. Um, I'm a teacher and obviously we're, we're currently taking industrial action. Um, I just wanted to know if there was any way that there could be more sort of, particularly with Unison, sort of more union collaboration, sort of both ways and what you would think about that and sort of ideas on, on how that can be done. Because um, at my school, for example, we've got lots of support workers who are members of Unison. Okay. And it's felt quite disjointed at the moment. So, what, yeah. OK, what, better unity with Unison and I, others. I, I mean, we certainly support the teachers' uh, action and we've we've put advice out to our members about what they should and shouldn't do when the strike's on. Uh, um, uh, I'm sure you're aware of this, Amy, but the, the, the issue we've got in the education sector is teachers have their very own um, set of negotiations or pay, pay settlement, and that comes through a pay review body. The, the the school staff, the support staff, are part of the local government negotiations. Ah, it's called okay. the National Joint Council for Local Government. I see. And we've already settled pay in that area. So we got an award last year that was out. We consulted our members. They voted to accept it. And therefore, pay is settled for this year up until April. Um, come April, again, who knows what will happen in local government. And it may well be that after April, we may, may well be taking strike action at the same time as you in schools. So just before you go, Sharon in Dundee. Christina, you talk about Labour being in power. As a fellow Scot, do you want Labour in power in Scotland over the SNP? Uh, I couldn't possibly comment on that. Uh, uh, and I say this in my role as General Secretary, not uh, because um, we leave that entirely up to our members in Scotland. So the people I represent in Scotland will take a decision about what Unison's policy will be in relation to the political parties there. But we are affiliated to the Labour Party. It's the only party we're affiliated to. And therefore, that's why we use that language. We we want a Labour government in power in Westminster. And I usually always say that. Apologies if I didn't say it earlier. I nearly always say we want a Labour government in Westminster because there are different complexions across the, the UK, not just in Scotland, but also in Northern Ireland, of course, where Labour don't stand. Grateful for your time, Christina. Thank you for coming by the studio. I imagine I'll be talking to you on a picket line again soon. Well, <laughs> Probably. <laughs> unless peace breaks out. Christina. Sadiq Khan faces fresh opposition to his ULEZ expansion policy, but this time it's from within his own party. I'm LBC's Henry Riley with the exclusive. Plus, Queen Consort Camilla has COVID. What does that mean for her public engagements? It's all after the news. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 7 o'clock, the threat posed by aerial surveillance will be discussed at a meeting of NATO defence ministers later. The summit in 